I have to confess that the first time I met Dale, many years ago, I actually said to him, well, I'm a little put off by Chesterton because I have to stretch so far to appreciate his metaphors. And for <laughs> I actually said that to you. Uh, for instance, finding a trifle in my pocket, Chesterton invites me to see maybe a pocket knife as the symbol of the feudal age of chivalry, or to see in it industrial war, perhaps recognize it as the symbol of the oldest of the needs of man, or perhaps I find a matchbox in my pocket and see it as a symbol of fire, stronger and more primitive even than steel, or a piece of chalk and see it as all the art of the world and all the frescoes of the world. Well, I've since been humbled by rereading Chesterton to realize that the exercise of the imagination is necessary for us to transcend our immediate physical world. The world of the materialists of the early 20th century that Chesterton was critiquing, he was critiquing modernism. We need our imaginations to reach the realm of the spiritual where the most profound wisdom lies. So thank you for coming to share your wisdom with us about Chesterton today. Dale is one of the most respected Chesterton scholars in the world. He's president of the American Chesterton Society, creator and host of the EWTN series, G.K. Chesterton, The Apostle of Common Sense, and publisher of Gilbert Magazine. He's written three books, the most recent of which is The Complete Thinker, and he's got several books on the back table, and has contributed to and edited another 15 book. He's given over 400 talks at colleges and universities around the world, including Harvard, Yale, Oxford. He's also spoken at the House of Lords, and the Vatican. This is his third visit to Spring Arbor University. The first time he was here, he was kind enough to serve as the reader for one of our English majors honors theses on Chesterton. And that student is now completing his dissertation on Chesterton. So as a Chesterton evangelist, he's been very successful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for what you've given us already and what you have for us today. Dale is also speaking tonight at 7. Truth in the State of Transmission, Chesterton on Liberal Arts Education. So I'm sure you will want to come back for that one as well. Please help me welcome Dale Alpha. Well, thank you, Kimberly, for that lovely introduction. And it's great to be back here to Spring Harbor for the third time. It's very strange that some place would invite me back that many times. <laughs> Apparently, no one listened to what I had to say the first time. <laughs> this is not going to be an introductory talk on Chesterton. Uh, if you're not familiar with Chesterton at all, well, that's terrible. <laughs> but I do have some books that I'll sell you, which will serve as excellent introductions to Chesterton. Uh, and, and if you haven't heard of Chesterton, it's, it's not your fault, because um, even though Chester is taught here at, at Spring Harbor, uh, he's just not taught enough in most places. And he, he's gone from being one of the most popular writers in the world, where everyone knew who he was back in the early 20th century, to some generations going by and him falling off the map and now being rediscovered. Uh, but but your, even though your life is dreadfully incomplete, if you haven't uh, heard of Chesterton, things are going to be improving immediately right now. Uh, this talk is on Shakespeare, Chesterton's uh, writing on Shakespeare. Now, if you've never heard of Shakespeare, <laughs> I don't even know how to finish that sentence. <laughs> Chesterton is well accomplished in many forms of writing. And I think one of his most uh, outstanding genres is, is literary criticism, and probably the least, uh, least appreciated. And, but as a literary critic, it's interesting, especially a literary critic of Shakespeare, he's less a critic of Shakespeare than he is of, of the critics of Shakespeare. He's uh, especially a critic of those who would psychoanalyze Shakespeare, and who would not only psychoanalyze Shakespeare, but psychoanalyze Shakespeare's characters. He's a critic of those who would, in his word, turn good poetry into bad metaphysics. 
He's a critic of those who would take this great universal writer and force him into a very narrow modern philosophy. He's a critic of those who, in finding that Shakespeare can express their own despair, uh, mistakenly assume that Shakespeare himself was despairing. And he's a critic of those who simply cannot connect with an audience and therefore cannot understand why Shakespeare does connect with an audience and why he can still bring them in after 400 years. And uh, he's also a critic of those who would have the audacity to say how they would have written Shakespeare when he says it is Shakespeare who has written us. He's also a critic of those who uh, say that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare, <laughs> but was somebody else. But most of all, I would say he's a critic of, of those critics who are simply small, who are so tiny in their imaginations that they can't uh, possibly do anything except criticize Shakespeare. For instance, there are those who would complain that Shakespeare borrowed all his plots. Chesterton says, if Shakespeare borrowed, he jolly well paid back. Most critics, he says, suffer from the art of missing the point. Now, uh, as a literary critic, uh, what Chesterton does is he makes us, he, he explains to the audience what the audience does feel, not what it should feel. When you go and see a Shakespeare play and you're trying to figure out what it was you just saw, Chesterton has a great way of explaining it to you. And you go, yeah, that's what I just saw. And those are exactly the feelings that I felt when I was watching the play. And that's really, he said, what the function of a literary critic is, is to put into words the audience's own reaction, rather than to tell them what they were supposed to have uh, felt. And, and that's Chesterton's great strength, is he, he explains to us things that we already know. He shocks us with truths that we know to be truth, but, but we, we recognize them for the first time. The shock of recognition thing that we've been staring at. Um, one, of, uh, one of Chesterton's uh, great strengths, as, uh, as is Shakespeare's great strengths, is to connect with the audience. He's not, he, he, shares the, uh, he shares the audience's own artistic instincts, the desire for beauty, the desire for joy, for justice, for a good joke. He's not at war with the audience like so many modern artists are. Uh, and, uh, and Chesterton actually makes the argument that an artist who is misunderstood is misunderstood because he's not very good. <laughs> Which is really a shocking thing to say. <laughs> but, uh, but the greatness of the artist is really measured in his ability to express the inexpressible. That's what the artist does. And the really great poet does connect with the common man because he gives the common man the great gift of words. And Chesterton says um, that we hunger for the right word more than we hunger for any college student writing a paper will understand what that is like, you know. What am I trying to say? There's a word for it. And even the thesaurus of the computer doesn't know what the word is. So, so that it's that combination of the common touch with, with the uncommon touch. Combining the, the ordinary with the extraordinary. That's what makes great art. And, uh, and there's something, of course, uh, we, we talk about the right words and how you know, Shakespeare and the other great poets give us the right words. Chesterton gives us the right words. But there's a great irony. 
that Chesterton points out that has weakened Shakespeare's great achievement. And he says that is the abominable gift of quoting Shakespeare without reading Shakespeare. There's an old joke about the woman who went to see Hamlet. And when she came out, she said, well, it's nothing but quotations. <laughs> And, and you know anybody who's read Chesterton's book Orthodoxy knows that you 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 basically underline every sentence in the book, and then you get to the end of the book and you go, what was that about anyway? A lot of good quotes though. So there's 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 a danger in those really good lines, and and Chesterton says that. Uh, of Shakespeare's great quotations, that they have a mysterious power of making the world weary of a few fixed and disconnected words, and yet leaving the world entirely ignorant of the real meaning of those words. Because we quote these phrases over and over again, and we, and we forget actually what they are about. And so we have to start with this obvious truth that there's more to Shakespeare than his great quotations, just like there's more to Chesterton and his great quotations. However, it's impossible to talk about either of them without quoting them, which is what I'm going to do now. In fact, that's almost all I'm going to do. Uh, because that would be a great waste to talk about two of the greatest writers in the English language and not quote them. Uh, in fact, Chesterton actually has been called the Shakespeare of the aphorism because he's so quotable. And, uh, because besides being, being witty and snappy and profound and illuminating, uh, Chesterton simply writes beautiful prose. In fact, Orson Welles called Chesterton's prose shamelessly beautiful. Here's an example of him waxing eloquent on Shakespeare. He says, we are surrounded in this world by huge and anonymous forces. As they rush by us, we throw a name at them. Love, death, destiny, remembrance. But the things themselves are infinitely vaster and more varied than the names. True artistic symbolism exists in order to provide another alphabet than the alphabet of language. It is not that a sea at sunset represents sorrow, but that a sea at sunset represents a great deal of the truth which is missed by the word sorrow. So it is with Shakespeare. It's not that Shakespeare is a mere philosopher. It is that philosophy is one way of describing certain unutterable things, and Shakespeare is another. Shakespeare was, in one sense, a thorough mystic. He saw in every stone in the street things which cannot be uttered till the end of the world. Good stuff. Now, I said that Chester is a uh, critic of those who would psychoanalyze Shakespeare and psychoanalyze his characters. And of course, when I use the word psychoanalyze, there's only one name that comes to mind. He's smoking a cigar, and his name is Sigmund Freud. And the, 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 you know, the discipline of psychology was still rather in its infancy when Chesterton still was, was writing, and, and, but Freud was still all the rage, and, and Freud was really having a heyday with, uh, with Shakespeare's plays and, and using them to propound his theories. And one of the, the main Freudian ideas is that we suffer from the suppression of our impulses. And Chesterton points out that Shakespeare's plays make precisely the opposite point of that. He says, Lady Macbeth does not suffer as a sleepwalker because she has resisted the impulse to murder Duncan, but rather by some curious trick of thought because she has yielded to it. Hamlet's uncle is in a morbid frame of mind, not as one would naturally expect because he had thwarted his own development by leaving his own brother alive, but actually because he has triumphantly liberated himself from the morbid impulse to pour poison in his brother's ear. On the theory of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis a man ought to be haunted by the ghosts of all the men he has not murdered. 
Yet Shakespeare certainly seems to represent Macbeth as haunted by Banquo. The psychoanalysts are especially interested in the things of which Hamlet was unconscious, not to mention the things of which Shakespeare was unconscious. It did not seem to occur to the writers that there might possibly be something slightly painful at best in cutting the throat of your own uncle and the husband of your own mother. I do not quite see why it should be an unconscious aversion. It seems just possible that a man might be quite conscious of not liking such a job. But to follow the arguments of these critics, one would think that murdering the head of one's family was a sort of family joke. In, in plain words, this sort of criticism has lost the last rags of common sense. Hamlet requires no sub, such subconscious explanation because he explains himself. And perhaps he was rather too fond of doing so. He was a man to whom duty had come in a very dreadful and repulsive form, and to a man not fitted for that form of duty. There was a conflict, but he was conscious of it from beginning to end. Chesterton says that this subconscious revulsion is not in Hamlet. It's actually in, it's in the, the critics. It's the critic that's trying to avoid something. And the, what the critic is trying to avoid is the morality in which Shakespeare himself believed. Hamlet's struggle is between duty and inclination. The critic tries to make it a, a, a struggle between the conscious and the unconscious. And he gives, as he says, Chester says, he gives Hamlet a complex in order to avoid giving him uh, a real conscience. And the whole tragedy, the whole, in fact, the whole concept of tragedy is based on morality. It has to be. And it involves three moral propositions. First, that it may be our main business to have to do the right thing, and that we detest the wicked. Second, that the right thing may involve punishing some person, especially a powerful person. And third, that the process of punishment may take the form of fighting and killing. And uh, the modern critic is prejudiced against the first principle, calls it asceticism. Prejudice against the second principle, calls it vindictiveness. Prejudice against the third principle, calls it militarism. That it actually might be the duty of a young man to risk his own life, much against his own inclination, by drawing a sword and killing a tyrant. That is an idea instinctively avoided by the mood of our modern times, and that is why tyrants have such a good time in the modern times. Another idea that the uh, critics get wrong about Hamlet is that they call him a skeptic. Chesterton says, if Hamlet had been a skeptic, there would have been no tragedy. If he had had any skepticism at all to exercise, he would have exercised it right away upon that improbable ghost of his father. And then he would have uh, simply called that eloquent person a hallucination and married Ophelia and lived happily ever after. The utter mistake of regarding Hamlet as a skeptic arose, says Chesterton, of quoting some stilted passages out of context, such as, to be or not to be. That's right, that's, that's one of them. <laughs> it's a really famous one. Um, the, other, the other passage that gets quoted to prove that Hamlet is a skeptic is, uh, is when he says, Chester's must be in the obvious gesture of fatigue. Why then, tis none to you, for there's nothing either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. Chester says, Hamlet says this because he's getting sick of the company of two silly men, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. But if anyone wishes to see how utterly and entirely opposite is Hamlet's attitude, you can see it in the very same conversation. If anyone wishes to listen to the words of a man who is, in the most final sense, not a skeptic, hear are the words. This goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. 
this most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave overhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Chesterton says, oddly enough, I've heard this passage quoted as a pessimistic passage. It is perhaps the most optimistic passage in all of human literature. It is the absolute expression of the ultimate fact of the faith of Hamlet. His faith that although he cannot see that the world is good, he knows that it is good. That although he cannot see that man is the image of God, he knows that man is the image of God. The modern conception of Hamlet believes only in mood. The real Hamlet, like the church, believes in mood. Many fine optimists have praised man when they felt like praising him. Only Hamlet has praised man when he felt like kicking him. Many poets like Shelley and Whitman have been optimistic when they felt optimistic. Only Shakespeare has been optimistic when he felt pessimistic. And this is the definition of faith. A faith is that which is able to survive a mood. All right, as great, uh, as, as, just as, as Hamlet is, uh, is accused of being a skeptic, uh, just based on a few often quoted passages. Shakespeare is accused of being a pessimist because of a passage from Macbeth. And one of those accusers was George Bernard Shaw, Chesterton's great intellectual opponent. Uh, Chesterton and Shaw had wonderful debates with each other. They didn't agree on anything, and yet they remained very good friends and respected each other, even though they, they definitely staged wonderful debates for, uh, for the world. Chesterton, of course, six foot four, 300 pounds, enjoyed his wine and his beef and his cigars, and George Bernard Shaw, you know, all of 98 pounds, and vegetarian teetotaler. Yeah. Chesterton says to Shaw, I see there's been a famine in the land. <laughs> Shaw responds, and I see the cause of it. <laughs> Chesterton, uh, Shaw says to Chesterton, if I were as fat as you, Chesterton, I'd hang myself. Chesterton says, if I were to hang myself, Shaw, I would use you as the rope. <laughs> So Shaw accuses Shakespeare of being a pessimist, based on the very famous soliloquy of Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. To the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out. Out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Chesterton says, now this seems a curious instance to select. Surely it cannot have escaped, Mr. Shaw, that this speech has a dramatic value. It's a speech by Macbeth just before his defeat and his destruction. That is to say, it is a speech made by a wicked and wasted human soul confronted by his own colossal failure. 
The speech is not a metaphysical statement at all. It's just an emotional explanation. And Mr. Shaw has no right to call Shakespeare a pessimist for having written the words, out, out, brief candle. He might as well call Shakespeare a champion of celibacy for having written the words, get thee to a nunnery. <laughs> it's not Shakespeare's fault that having to write pessimism for the purpose of a theatrical point happened to write much better pessimism than the people who are silly enough to be pessimists. As great as the as Hamlet is, and Chesterton says Hamlet is bigger than all of the literature, bigger than any of our categories, bigger than any of our condemnations or our praise. He's just such a giant character in literature. As great as the play Hamlet is, Chesterton says Macbeth is Shakespeare's greatest tragedy, his greatest drama. He says, I think the greatest drama in the world is Macbeth because it is the one Christian drama. I mean by Christian, its strong sense of spiritual liberty, of sin. The idea that the best man can be as bad as he chooses. You may call Othello a victim of chance, you may call Hamlet a victim of temperament. You cannot call Macbeth anything but a victim of Macbeth. Macbeth is the supreme Christian tragedy as opposed to Oedipus, which is the supreme pagan tragedy. It's the whole point about Oedipus that he does not know what he's doing. It's the whole point about Macbeth that he does know what he's doing. And it's not a tragedy of fate, but of free will. What Chesterton says, uh, when he says it's a tragedy of free will, he means he says, there comes a moment in the play when if the play is acted well, and Macbeth uh, says to, to Lady Macbeth, we will proceed no further in this business. Even if you know what's going to happen, you say, maybe he won't do it this time. <laughs> Come on, Macbeth, don't, don't blow it. Do the right thing. You hope, you hope it will, but you, you get to watch, you get to watch it happen. And the main lesson you get from Macbeth is that you cannot commit a sin in order to be happy. You cannot do a mad thing in order to reach sanity. Chesterton says the crime does not get rid of the problem. Its effect is so bewildering that one may say the crime does not even get rid of the temptation. Make a morbid decision and you will only become more morbid. Do a lawless thing and you will only get into an atmosphere much more suffocating than that of the law. Indeed, it's a mistake to speak of a man as breaking out. The lawless man never breaks out. He breaks in. He smashes a door and finds himself in another room, a smaller room. He smashes a wall and finds himself in yet a smaller room. The more he shatters, the more his habitation shrinks. And where he ends, you may read in the end of Macbeth. The other great thing about Macbeth that even compounds the tragedy is the tragedy of Lady Macbeth. The loyal wife who wants what's best for her husband. Chesterton says the most masculine man is always ruled by his wife. He's always, Chesterton's always suspicious of the man who's not just a little bit afraid of his wife. <laughs> he says, unlike most married couples in fiction, you can really believe that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are married to each other. He said the dispute that goes on between Macbeth and his wife about the murder of Duncan is almost word for word a dispute that goes on around any suburban breakfast table any morning. We just change the words, infirm of purpose, give me the daggers, to infirm of purpose, give me the postage stamps. <laughs> he says the strengths of the two partners differ in kind. The woman has more of that strength on the spot, which we call industry, whereas the man has more of that, that strength in reserve that we call laziness. <laughs> <laughs> now, even though 
Chesterton says that Macbeth is the greatest of Chesterton's. Chesterton says that Shakespeare is the greatest of Shakespeare's tragedies. He doesn't call it the greatest of Shakespeare's plays. He gives that honor to Midsummer Night's Dream. Chesterton says it's harder to get comedy right than to get tragedy right. He says it may be more important to have a great imagination than to have great wit, but it's easier to pretend to have a great imagination <laughs> than to pretend to have great wit. And I'm going to read a, a passage here when he writes about Midsummer Night's Dream. It, it's really quite astonishing. He says, the sentiment maybe of the, of the play can be summed up in one sentence. It's the mysticism of happiness. That is to say, it is the conception that as a man lives upon a borderland, he may find himself in a spiritual or supernatural atmosphere, not only uh, through being profoundly sad or meditative, but also by being extravagantly happy. The soul might be wrapped out of the body in an agony of sorrow or a trance of ecstasy. But it might also be wrapped out of the body in a paroxysm of laughter. Sorrow, we know, can go beyond itself. Well, according to Shakespeare, pleasure can go beyond itself and become something dangerous and unknown. In pure poetry and the intoxication of words, Shakespeare never rose higher than he rises in this play. But the supreme literary merit of Midsummer Night's Dream is its design, the amazing symmetry, the amazing artistic and moral beauty of its design. The story opens in the sane and common world, pleasant seriousness of very young lovers, very young friends. Then as the figures advance into the tangled wood of young troubles and stolen happiness, a change and bewilderment begins to fall on them lose their way and they lose their wits and they are in the heart of fairyland. And their words, their hungers, their figures grow more and more dim and fantastic like dreams within dreams. And then the dream fumes begin to clear. The characters and the spectators begin to awaken together to the noise of horns and dogs and the clean embracing morning. And the whole company falls back into a splendid human laughter. All the dreams have been forgotten, and so the play seems naturally ended. It began on Earth, it ends on Earth. And thus to round off the whole Midsummer Night's Dream and an eclipse of daylight is an effect of genius. But in this comedy, the mark of that genius goes beyond itself, and one touch is added which makes the play colossal. Theseus and his train retire with a crashing finale, full of humor, wisdom, things set right, and silence falls on the house. And then there comes the faint sound of little feet. And then, for a moment, as it were, the elves look into the house, asking, which is the reality? Suppose we are the realities and they the shadows. And if that ending is acted properly, any man should feel shaken to the marrow if he had to walk home from the theater through a country lane. <laughs> Another artistic point of perfection is the accurate manner in which the play catches the atmosphere of a dream. The chase and tangle and frustration of the incidents and personalities are known to everyone who has ever dreamed of falling over precipices or perpetually missing trains. Here's the pursuit of the man we cannot catch and the flight from the man we cannot see. Here's the perpetual returning to the same place and the crazy alteration and the very objects of our desire, the substitution of one face for another face, putting the wrong souls in the wrong bodies, the fantastic disloyalties of the night. I love that phrase, the fantastic disloyalties of the night. You know, if there were no Chesterton, and some college English student handed in an essay like that. Any proper English professor would fall on her knees and thank God and just retire in joy. 
It is just the most perfect piece of literary writing about, you know, writing about a piece of literature. Now, Chester points out it's interesting that you can have common characters in a tragedy, but you can't have tragic characters in a comedy. You can have the grave digger in Hamlet, but you can't have Ophelia in A Midsummer Night's Dream. It doesn't work. Um, and he says there's a reason for that. The common man, even when he's engaged in a tragic occupation, has always refused to be tragic. And, uh, and what's interesting about this several Dream is with one little twist, all of, the, all of the events in it could be considered tragic and cruel, but instead they're hilarious. It's just that fine line which makes them hilarious. And, and of course, one of the great characters that makes it hilarious is, is Bob the Weaver, who wears the asses in. And, and Chester says it's one, truly one of the greatest characters in all, all of Shakespeare's writing. Uh, he's, he's, more, he's more mysterious than Hamlet. Uh, he, he's, he's got this, this, he's larger than life, too. Every time he's on stage, you know, he fills the stage. And when he's gone from the stage, you want him to come back as soon as possible. And, and he, uh, he represents that, that, uh, that great fool who towers over the small fool. <laughs> uh, he says he can eat giants. I love that. <laughs> he eats giants for breakfast. And he says, we've all known men who might justly be described as brainless, but whose presence in the room is like a roaring fire, and, and whose entrance is an exit are, are events in themselves and just haunt the mind. And he has the supreme mark of what it does, you know, being like a true saint or a true hero, because he differs from humanity in being more human than humanity. So, Shakespeare wrote all these amazing plays. For some question, for some reason, the question comes up. Well, who wrote Shakespeare? This, this was an issue during Chesterton's lifetime. During Chesterton's lifetime, the leading theory out there was that Francis Bacon wrote all of Shakespeare's plays. And uh, later, just after his death, the theory was that Christopher Marlowe wrote all of Shakespeare's plays. The current theory in Bowie is that the Earl of Oxford wrote Shakespeare. Chesterton writes in orthodoxy in 1908. Shakespeare is quite himself. It's only his critics who determined that he was someone else. The one thing he points out about all these theories is that they all come from America. <laughs> he says the great transatlantic theory that Shakespeare was not Shakespeare but someone else with a different name is one of those intellectual pestilences which break out recurrently in countries that do not pay sufficient attention to intellectual sanitation. <laughs> I've never been insulted so well as when, Ch when Chesterton says that my country does not pay sufficient attention to intellectual sanitation. He had great fun. Uh, Chesterton did with the absurd claims of those who were at his time claiming that it was Bacon who planted these cryptograms in the play. In fact, there was one uh, one uh, group of Baconians who not only said that Bacon wrote Shakespeare, but that he also wrote uh, the works of Spencer and Green and Marlowe and uh, even Cervantes. <laughs> During Chesterton's time, an original painting of Shakespeare was discovered. And it was uh, discovered hanging in a tavern. And Chesterton thought that was just great that they found it in a tavern because that's where he would have found Shakespeare. <laughs> but he noticed how upset that the, uh, the, the Francis Bacon devotees were by the discovery because they thought that every portrait of Shakespeare should be a portrait of Francis Bacon. Um, but the argument about who really wrote Shakespeare is always 
has as its basis the suspicion that a mere actor, not educated in great English universities, could not possibly have penned such masterpieces. And as Chester points out, that's simply the argument of a snob. But there's another argument offered, and Chester deals with that argument as well. Somebody will ask, well, why was there not more excitement about such a sensational genius? And Chester just says the obvious answer to that is, why indeed? Which brings me to my very final point. You see, I maintain that G.K. Chesterton is the greatest writer of the 20th century. And the objection to that claim is usually something like, well, if he's so great, why haven't more people heard of him? Why isn't he taught, required in all the universities and colleges? And why is there not more excitement about such a sensational genius? To which the obvious answer is, why indeed? Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, go ahead. You mentioned your 
your TV series. Is that a How do we get to see that? You can go uh, to uh, EWTN.com, and it's on Sunday evenings. Uh, you can just go to live streaming. It's Sunday evenings, and we're at Eastern Time Zone, so we'll be on at 7 p.m. When I say 9, when I say 7, I mean 9. <laughs> A new season's coming out in two months. Is there a way to get that back? Yes, you can learn it from Chesterton.org. We have the, the DVDs. And the, yeah. Yeah. You sure will. Thanks for your books or anything. 